All right, now we're rolling. We're live. Cool. How are you doing today, Jessica? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing good. good. I can tell you're excited. I'm very excited. <laughs> <laughs> you said this was your first podcast ever. It is. Do you intend on doing any more? Any other podcasts? I would love to. I actually, I own my own business, Safe Space Life Consulting. So I do emotional health and my goal at some point I actually just started a blog. I would love to do like live webinar where I can do Q and A with people and teach oh. people about emotional health and different things. So this is kind of a, a good like oh so these are the kind of things that I <laughs> could need if I like do live things interactive. Yeah. So, well, yeah. The, the great thing about technology now is you really do not need a lot of equipment. Like if you yeah. want to do something like that, all yeah. you need is your phone. That's true. So it's super easy. However. It, having like a setup is so much nicer. Yeah. <laughs> it, it feels so, so much more official. I mean, anybody can just throw up a phone, but when you have like yeah. a studio space or like microphones, you just feel like you're kind of in the zone. Right. Yeah. yeah. So maybe yeah. someday. It adds to the experience. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. Um, so you have an emotional consulting business. Yes. What does that consist of? So it's safe space life consulting. It is in the emotional health realm. It's okay. similar to therapy in that I get to know your story. I get to know what's going on in the day to day, the different things and like emotions that come up on a regular basis now. But what I do is I look at where it's tied to in your history. So a lot of our belief systems, the way that we run our lives, our habits, our patterns actually come from zero to 12. So like the most formidable years, mm. our roadmap, our belief systems, who we are as a person actually starts between zero and 12. And so that's not generally where our brain thinks that it comes from because your brain isn't actually fully formed until you're 26 years old yeah. with your prefrontal cortex and your amygdala. And so your logic and reasoning between zero and 12 can be very skewed based on who your parents were, who your friends were, where you went to school, whether you grew up in church, just whatever kind of society functions even. And so what I do is I say, where in your history did some of these beliefs that you have come from? Like self-hatred, anxiety, self-doubt, self-sabotage, different things like that. And so I look at okay, so this is what your family was like. You had a lot of siblings, and so maybe you felt really invisible, or, which is part of my story. <laughs> I don't have a lot of siblings, but, um, or maybe you were an only sibling, and you got to experience a lot of different things, but your parents were abusive, or your teachers put you down. And so I just kind of look at those different things, and I pick up little hints kind of along the way to see, oh, hey, when you were in this setting, maybe you were out at a social function and you were surrounded by people and you were surrounded by a whole lot of people who love you, but deep down inside, you're actually feeling really alone and really abandoned. Okay, let's look at the emotions that are coming up. What kinds of memories could that be tied to? And then I bring compassion into those places. So I say, hey, it makes a lot of sense that you would feel really alone in a space of people that really love you because... Maybe you were that kid that was in the middle of people who are supposed to love you and you felt really alone and invisible. So, but the truth is you are really lovable. You are really amazing and you're worth spending time with. You're worth being invested in. You're worth cherishing and taking time for. And so I get to do that with people and get to know their stories. So, whoa. Yeah, that's um, a lot. <laughs> that, that is a lot. Now, I can't even imagine having to try to break the ice with somebody and then trying to get to the deep roots of an issue like yeah. that. It's got to be extremely difficult. Um, I mean, it depends on the person. So generally, if people are seeking me out, they are already kind of on their journey to some extent, or at least they want to start. So they're willing to put the work in. And so like my first session with a client will be... I do an intake and figure out like some of their backstory, some of their family story, um, kind of what their family structure was like. Mm -hmm. And then my intake says, give me a five minute story of your entire life. Like, Jeez. yeah. <laughs> and I tell them uh, right up front, I'm like, I know it's not going to be five minutes. It's my job to watch the clock, but tell me who you are, what makes you, you. And so then that's when I start kind of picking up clues like, Oh, you have siblings. Oh, you were an only child. Oh, maybe your parent passed away really young. That would immediately trigger me to say, 
there's probably some abandonment somewhere in your childhood if you lost a parent really early on, if you have divorce in your family, um, if you moved a lot as a kid, that's another like every single move can be a traumatic event if you don't have the support around you to help you feel your feelings and move through them. Right, right. Now, I would assume by finding those things, Mm -hmm. those specific issues that people are struggling with and talking about them is, in a sense, a way to, um, I guess, overcome. Overcome your your emotional, whatever state of being you're in, Mm -hmm. anxiety, just by talking about it, right? Essentially, yeah, because healing happens in connection. And so when you give a voice to something, um, because trauma, there's actually like a a trauma cycle or a pain cycle that happens in our brain. So all of our blood in our um, prefrontal cortex, our logic and reasoning, when you get triggered into your like fight, flight, freeze, fawn response, all of the blood rushes to the... Yes. What is that? (laughs) (laughs) So if you were to assign like animals to each of them, fight is like a bear where it's like I come off aggressive. It's I'm protecting myself. Yeah. Flight is I need to run away from the situation like a bird or just like being really, really busy like a busy bee. Uh, Freeze is like a turtle. Like I don't feel safe. So I just shell up. I shut down all of my emotions shut down. Fawn is like a puppy. Mm. So if I don't feel safe, I'm going to make myself as cuddly as possible. I'm going to like slap you in the face with an apology. Like, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. Like, what can I do to make it better? So that's actually the fourth 4F response. So so when your prefrontal cortex shuts down, all of the blood in your brain rushes to your amygdala. That's when you trigger into your 4F response. Mm-hmm. And so totally lost where I was going. You were, you were talking about fawn. Mm -hmm. Um, so obviously not everybody has all four of those. You're either one, one or the other generally, right? It can depend on the relationship even. Okay. Yeah. Like if somebody is more superior to you or something, you might like like, kind of back down like. And I mean, it depends on your personality too. Um, I can either, most people have maybe a core two. So, um, in my own relationships, I can either go into a fight response where I get really angry or I go into freeze where I just shut down emotionally. Mm. Um, but it can depend on relationship. It can be- depend on scenario. There was even another a day last week, I think, where my husband and I were having a conversation and I could feel myself going into fawn where it was like, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. Like I'm the worst or <laughs> like just making myself seem softer because I had done something wrong, shame set in. So this episode is brought to you by red bike delivery this delivery service operates only using battery powered eco-friendly transportation red bike delivery is there for all your delivery needs whether it's dinner for the family flowers for your partner or new house plants for your new collection red bike delivery will gladly deliver those and everything in between so what are you waiting for check out red bike delivery on facebook or instagram for more information red bike delivery because there's only one earth That's a good thing though, right? To apologize if you like if you were uh, wrong or something. Absolutely. It's not necessarily like a fawn thing, right? Um it it, it depends on the motivation. I yeah. mean it's not it's never wrong to apologize if you have something to repair. Right. If you right. feel like like let's say the conversation between him and I was actually really benign, yeah. but I got triggered into like little girl me and I thought I was talking with my dad or something is how I felt inside. Maybe our conversation was actually pretty equal and I didn't do anything wrong, but shame said, Oh no, actually like you're in the wrong. Like Mm. you did something to hurt him and he's just fine. Yeah. Yeah. So, or it could be where like, yeah, I need to own up to my stuff, but it's kind of the motivation. Like if I can feel in my body that like, I'm moving out of a regulated state where oh, okay. I can breathe easy. I'm calm and relaxed. I'm actually in a connected space. Right. Then it's more of a four F response. Okay. Yeah. Now, what made you get into this? Did you have something in your in your past that made you want to help other people, or? Yeah. Did you go to school for this? I'm currently in a life consulting master class right okay. now. So, um, my husband and I just some backstory of mine. I'm actually a Lansing native, so my husband and I both went to Eastern High School, born and raised here, 
Uh, we're high school sweethearts, so oh, we've wow. known each other for, yeah, <laughs> we've known each other for about 17 years, and our wedding anniversary is actually in two days on July 7th, Whoa. so 10 years. Oh, congrats. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so he and I, um, oh, I love him so much, um, but... What's your husband's name? Paul. Paul. Shout out to Paul. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> love you, babe. <laughs> um, so my family growing up, I was raised kind of Catholic. My, my dad's side of the family is really Catholic. I love them. They're the best. Um, my mom's side of the family is more shut down. Not kind of, not really. They Mm -hmm. just don't talk about a lot of things. My mom or my dad's side of the family also doesn't really talk about things. Um, it's something to do with like uh, past generations, right? Where they don't want to talk about things. Like I've had people in my own family, my, my real family, like when I first started this podcast, they're like, why did you talk about that? Like that's yeah. how you fix things. That's how you change the world is you talk about your issues and you work through them and that's how you yeah. overcome. Oh, that's where we were going. Healing happens in connection. Yep. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I completely agree. So my mom was the youngest of five with four older brothers. Yeah. My dad was the youngest of seven. And so I've got a really big family <laughs> on my dad's side. Um, my mom's side, I have some like cousins, but not as many, which is fine. Um, but my dad's parents divorced when he was six years old and my mom's parents, her dad passed when she was nine and her mom passed when she was 19. Whoa. Yeah. So my mom didn't really understand nurture. I am kind of growing to maybe assume, unfortunately she's uh, no longer, she passed three and a half years ago. Your mom did? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, And so there was a lot of kind of fear and control when she parented. She was a stay-at-home mom. She was there, I mean, the majority of my life. My dad was a working dad. Um, He worked two jobs at some points. He traveled for work for a couple years. Um, So we lived in Lansing, but he would drive to Ann Arbor. Um, There was a spell for like two years, so he would drive an hour and a half either way. Um, and so he was kind of gone, but he was really hardworking. And so like, I can see all of the good things and the logic behind it. Um, but little me, um, I'm growing to realize kind of felt neglected. So I have an older half brother and a younger brother who's like two years younger than I am. And he had ADHD and anxiety and depression from a really young age. I was kind of the golden child, the one that, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that got good grades. I was the teacher's pet for a long time. I was really shy at first, and then I would just kind of warm up to people. So my husband and I met in high school, and I had kind of been in the background. I was actually a goth in high school for a what? little while. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you when wouldn't did you know. Gra- when did you graduate? Uh, 2007. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's that's funny because that's back when there was clicks still. Oh, my gosh. I don't yes. really know if there are anymore. Uh, mm, I would, it would be very difficult for me <laughs> to believe that there aren't clicks still. I mean, still. I'm sure there are, but they're different. Like, yeah. I, like when we were in school, it was like gothic. There was um, jocks and there was nerds. and <laughs> band, <laughs> geeks, band geeks. Yeah, the popular crowd. Yeah. 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 And And now I don't even know. It's true. Well, I don't know. are you connected with any high schoolers? I mean, kind of, yeah. Kind of? Yeah. You should ask them the next time. Be like, are there still clicks around? I should. It's interesting, <laughs> though, because like, you see them walk out of school, and you're like, huh. I don't know. They all look kind of the same. The same. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think social media might have a little bit to play about oh, that, because yeah, true. everybody has access to be able to see everybody's That's true. stuff in that the open. True. Um, so when I was in high school, as a goth, I was Do you have a MySpace? Of, Oh, 100% I had a MySpace. That's actually how my husband and I kind of started dating is because we were MySpace friends. Did you move him to your top 10? uh, He was probably in my top 10 for for (laughs) sure. We were really good friends at first. Um, He wouldn't date me because I wasn't a Christian at first. And I was like, Mm. "Um, okay. But, um, and he was Catholic, right? um, He was non-denominational. My family was Catholic growing up. Okay. So um, over the summer... Um, between my junior and senior year, he and I had been talking back and forth and he had put up one of those things where it's like, put one, if you're single, two, if you're a couple, like three, if it's complicated and yeah, like all into the random things and like (laughs) 17 different options. And so he had put, it's complicated. And there was another girl that he was interested in at the time that I was trying to like hook him up with. And 
So I messaged him oh and I was goodness. like, is it complicated with this other chick? And he was like, no, it's actually complicated with you. And I'm like, I'm sorry. What? Like, <laughs> and I was interested first. So I was like, are you, are, like, is this real life? <laughs> like, and so I was like, what do you mean it's complicated with me? And he's like, I really like you, but you're not a Christian. And I'm like, dang it. <laughs> so, um, so I was like, I mean, I was working at the time. I was 17. He's two years younger than I am. And so I was like, if there's a Sunday that I'm not working, then maybe I guess I'll try to go to church with you. Cause I'd been raised that way, but I'd fallen away. Um, my grandma had passed and I was younger. And so we just kind of stopped going to church. But, um, so I met him, we started dating, dated for a couple of years. Um, stuff just kind of got complicated. And so he ended up going to a ministry school for a year. Then I ended up going to a ministry school for a year. And then while I was down there, he was like, so what school? Um, so it's called the Bethel school of supernatural ministry. So oh, okay. it's not accredited. Okay. But yeah. Most of them aren't. <laughs> it, it's true. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. My sister and my brother went to crown college um, okay. in T- Knoxville, Tennessee. It's a, oh, it's cool. a Christian school. And then, um, I actually, my brother actually went to, um, crap, what's it called? Uh, um, uh, Fairhaven, Fairhaven Baptist Bible college. Okay. That's in, uh, Indiana. Okay. Yeah. And those aren't accredited? No. Nope. Interesting. No, most of them aren't. I didn't yeah. know that. No, most of them aren't. That's very cool. Yeah. So like my sister and her husband and, uh, well, my brother didn't, did, he didn't get a degree, but my sister and her husband, um, they gra- they graduated from there and, uh, yeah, they can't really use their degrees. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not for anything outside of the church. <laughs> no, no, no. That's very interesting. Yeah, I can't it is use mine either. <laughs> it's, it's kind of frustrating, right? Yeah, yeah. So why did you choose to go there? Uh, self-development. Okay. So I had become a Christian in high school yeah. shortly before I started dating my husband. Oh, okay. Um, and so they were just really on fire for God. And when I became a Christian again... Um, the church that my husband was going to at the time, we ended up staying there for 10 years. He was a youth pastor there for five years. I was on the worship team. It was beautiful. I loved it so much. Love the community. Um, but the reason that I, and this could have even started my journey for emotional health actually. Um, cause when I walked in, like you could feel the sense of community and it was just like this safety. You knew that people were for you. And I don't know that I had ever felt anything like it because I mean, my home life, my younger brother, um, because he had a lot of behavioral issues, my mom kind of became his advocate, but because she also parented with like rage and fear and control. And that wasn't all the time. I mean, there's good Mm -hmm. and bad in every family. Yeah. Um, but because that was my normal and I felt kind of neglected, having safe people, and my dad was safe for a really long time, but he wasn't around all the time. Um, I was always a, a daddy's girl. That's always kind of <laughs> who I've been. Um, but having multiple people, like friends that were for me that didn't judge me for wearing the black pants and black shirts and all that stuff uh, when I was in high school. And um, it was kind of like, oh, I can actually be me and figure out what that is. And so this ministry school was kind of this exploration of the whole idea that God actually loves me for who I am, Mm -hmm. created me for who I am. And the only thing that he has for me to do is to learn how to be loved And that's all we have as humans is to learn how to love ourselves and love our neighbor as ourselves and love him. And so that was kind of this beautiful thing where I got to go and learn how to listen for his voice for myself and for other people and to learn how to pray for other people for healing, for wholeness, for connection, for um, just... Yeah, and so I think that's beautiful. one thing that turns people away from um, wanting to go to church and wanting to uh, be religious. Um, I grew up in church too. Okay. I went to uh, Calvary Baptist in Charlotte. Okay, and it was it was it's a fundamental Baptist uh, school or church. Sure. Um, so obviously on like Sunday mornings, everybody's wearing suit and tie, dresses for women or skirts. Like yeah. you don't wear pants. Like 
it's kind of this intimidating atmosphere yeah. because it's like almost uppity in a sense. Mm-hmm. So anybody who comes in off the street who's wearing jeans or maybe they have holes or like some, like maybe they're wearing a polo or judgment. Judgment. Yes. And so that's one thing that turns people away. It makes yeah. people nervous. They don't want to go to a church that where they have to change in order to go. Yeah, absolutely. And you shouldn't have to. Absolutely. It's just, it's just apparel. Yeah. Why does it matter? Yeah. You know, and obviously like you, you changed your apparel eventually, but yeah. but you were able to go to church and worship and feel yeah. like yourself and feel, feel like you could be a part of a movement without having to change who you were as a person. Yeah. This was actually my least favorite color in high school. Fun fact. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think about that until just now. Um, but yeah, so um, my husband actually went to the school in Indiana and I went to Georgia separate years. Um, and then we had kind of been talking on and off. We weren't uh, in a relationship at the time. Um, when I was in Georgia, we kind of just struck back up this conversation. Um, we ended up setting a date while I was in Georgia. Um, he told me on Christmas again that he loved me, but because it was his first year as a youth pastor, he was like, I want to finish focusing on this until you get home. And then we can kind of pick up the ball from where we left off and figure out where we want to go from there. I was like, okay, cool. Well, youth group, the year that goes with the school year. So like the summer is kind of the off season. And so we ended up like setting a date in March to get married that July. Whoa. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You guys weren't even dating? No. (laughs) Well, that's a funny story in and of itself, but Cause we had been kind of setting aside time every week to Skype at the time. Cause he was still up here and oh I was in gosh. Georgia. Yeah. It was, I love him. <laughs> I do. <laughs> he might hate me for telling the story, but he, it, I mean, he was doing the best that he could with what he knew Yeah. to try to set aside his time for youth group and to still like make sure that we were connected. And he didn't know that we were going to be getting married like seven months after he told me he loved me again. So who had the plans to get married? Um, we both did. We had been yeah. like talking back and forth. And then finally he sat down with his pastor um, at the time and was like, I need to figure this stuff out. Cause I had been thinking about doing a second year in Georgia. And so if I had done a second year, I would not have come home over the summer because he and I had been talking. And right. so he was like, okay, I kind of need to figure this out and figure out what we're going to do here because I don't want to lose her. <laughs> So he had talked to this pastor. They looked at the calendar. (laughs) I love him so much. And they were like, okay, so we've got like the fall. Like, do you want to wait another year? Like, do you want to wait until Jessica gets home? You can get engaged, wait another year. And he was like, there's no way that we're going to like, like if we're going to get married, we're just like, we're going to get married. There's no reason (laughs) to wait another year right? when we know, like we had known each other for seven years at that point. So it was like, if we're coming back together, like this is what we're choosing. We're both choosing in. Yeah. And so pastor was like, okay, let's look at dates. And it was his best friend at the time was getting married in September, which would have been the start of the school year. Um, He worked at the MSU Turf Grass and Research Center Mm. um, at the time, and August was their busiest month, so there was going to be no way he could get time off. Um, We had big family reunions at the end of July, (laughs) and so it was, and my birthday's in June, and I don't want, like, extra things around my birthday, because I don't want to be super Especially an anniversary. Right, because then it's, like, all about me. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. It's about us. And so (laughs) it was either July 14th, which is exactly a month after my birthday, or July 7th. And I love numbers. So 7, 7, 12, like, (laughs) was perfect. And so we were like, cool. So we set a date. And then he flew down, actually, a month and a half later and surprised me and proposed. So it was beautiful. I loved it. So then to kind of continue the story of my emotional health journey, um... Six months after we got married, we found out we were two months pregnant. She was a surprise. Our plan was two years. Whoa. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So very big surprise. And honestly, I think it was a godsend because up until that point, I still didn't like pink. I, um, and I had hoped for a boy because I grew up with brothers. I didn't know what sisters were. I still like hadn't grown into my femininity and Mm. like, learned how to love who I am as a woman. And so God kind of walked me through this journey of like the issues that I had with having a daughter were my fear of abandonment 
because um, my parents actually got divorced my senior year of high school, which um, was right around the time that I found my husband and also found Jesus. So it was like a really big transition year where my entire life got shaken up and I found hope at the same time. Um, I didn't know that that's kind of what it was um, at the time because I didn't really blame my dad for leaving because of all of the chaos. But at the same time, safety was removed. Like my security line left my home. And so he ended up just straight up left. So because of all of the issues with my brother and um, there had been some infidelity in my parents' past before they he'd, they'd even gotten married. Yeah. And my dad wanted to do the right thing in marrying my mom. Um, and all of this is stuff that I actually just recently found out oh, after man. she after she passed. So, um, and my mom would have been the first person to tell you, like, she was not a picture-perfect person. Yeah. Um, I mean, she bartended, she... And did drugs and alcohol. And she told me, um, as I was becoming an adult, I was 18. I was paying some of the bills in our home at the time after my dad left. I was working. I was going to LCC. I was paying my own way. I was paying my own car insurance and my own phone bill. That is a lot of responsibility. A lot of responsibility (laughs) as an 18 year old. Um, and I mean, because my mom had been a stay at home mom and my dad left, she kind of had to figure out who she was now Um, and I, I have so much compassion for my mom and for my dad. I I really do. Um, which is actually part of the problem with my story is because I don't know my own voice. (laughs) Um, but she had told me, um, at one point I was 19, I wasn't doing enough chores around the house. And so I had moved out. I was like, I'm doing so many other things, learning how to be an adult. And you're wanting me to like pick up extra stuff around the house, which I mean, of course she needed help. Absolutely. Um, And as an 18, 19, 20 year old, like both, I mean, both sides of the coin are valid. Yeah. And so she had finally told me, um, we sat down after I'd moved out for like a week and she was like, (laughs) I know 19 year olds, man, (laughs) Like there's such rubber bands. Um, But she had told me like, if I had rebelled with sex, drugs and rock and roll, she totally would have understood. She would have got it. She and I would have been on the same page because that was her life as an 18, 19 year old. But I rebelled with religion and she didn't know how to handle that Mm. because I got so involved in my church. I got involved in the youth group because that's where I felt safe. And so I didn't feel as safe at home. Uh, I didn't know that that's what I felt at the time, but that's where I felt connected. That's where I felt alive. Right. Um, And so when we were pregnant with my oldest daughter. Um, she'll be nine in October. Um, God was like, Hey Jessica, are you afraid that Paul's going to leave your daughter? I was like, no, like he's so loyal. And he's like, are you afraid that you're going to leave your daughter? I was like, Oh, that's heavy. And because I had kind of felt abandoned by my dad leaving, um, that was the fear. And God was like, you actually get to, write the story between your dad and your daughter and you have somebody who is so loyal to you. And I have the, the courage and the desire and the heart to make sure that she never feels abandoned. And so that was kind of the beginning of my journey of recognizing that, Oh, I have self abandonment issues. Uh, Well, abandonment at the time, I didn't realize that like how it plays out now Because once you realize like and take on that belief system of I've been abandoned or I am abandoned, it kind of can shift into I am abandonable Mm. and that becomes your identity. And so then you pick up self abandonment and that's how it can play out and and triggers and stuff like that. So um, rage and anger kind of came on in parenting because that's how I was parented. Yeah. I wasn't given space or emotions or, or space to have emotions because my mom didn't understand them. My dad wasn't around as much. And I'm sure to some extent he didn't understand them either. So it'd be something like you would just go like zero to a hundred like that. Like if some, I could, yeah. And I mean, with a newborn, like I'm feeling all of the hormones. Yeah. Um, and there was actually a day um, my daughter was maybe three, four, five days old and she 
like I would try to nurse her and she would just pass out. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then she would wake up and cry. And so I'd like go to nurse her and she would just pass out again. And so this happened for probably eight hours, oh like gosh. overnight. <laughs> and I had just lost it. And like you hear the stories of women who like shake their babies yeah. and stuff like that. And so I was so afraid that that would be my story. And yeah. at one point I literally was so frustrated because I'm exhausted and I'm hormonal and all of these new things with a new <laughs> baby and I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> but I like think, oh my gosh, my husband is amazing. He was like, I'll take her, you go get some sleep. But there's that fear of, I'm so exhausted. I don't know what I'm doing. I have no idea what you need. Yeah, And... I'm helpless. I don't have any answers. I don't have the solutions. And so my fight, like, I don't know. Like, I don't know. I yeah. don't have it. I don't <laughs> understand. And so, like, that was just kind of another triggered point where yeah. it was like, okay. And now on this side, I can say, hey, Jessica, it makes so much sense. You had no idea. Like, you're a first-time mom. And you were never equipped like I had, how old, was I? how old was I? I was 24 when she was born. I had 24 years of not knowing. And you weren't prepared at all. No. You weren't, you weren't expecting to have a child. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I love her. Like she's absolutely a godsend in so many ways. And I, oh, I would, I would not change that season at all. I think all. having a kid helps prepare you for life in so many different ways. Cause I had my uh, daughter when I was, um, 21. Okay. And so having that responsibility, I remember like my wife, she had uh, four other kids previous to me, okay. but, um, her and I were on different shifts. And so she had to go back to work and I'm on third shift having to take care of this baby. Oh and I remember the first time I had to stay home with a baby and I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Yeah. It was scary. Yeah. It was super scary. Yeah. Being this 21 year old dude, Absolutely. not knowing how to take care of, I'm like, how am I going to take care of this thing? <laughs> right. Did you have any of the stigma of like, well, and you mentioned to me earlier that you were in foster care. So yeah. I can imagine that there's probably a level of like not having a stable parent kind of playing into, did that play into it at all? Um, as, as far as what, like in, in what aspect? learning how to parent your own kid. Um, I definitely had like uh, an idea of like what I thought a parent should be. And obviously sure. it wasn't, it wasn't the right idea. It was more of, um, uh, like parent by like, like you said, a, like, uh, control, control yeah. and like discipline, yeah, yeah. discipline. Yeah. Like it's, and it's still something that, you know, I've had to work on consistently and still work on to this day. Um, Everybody I used to does. get, I used to get angry. Like you said, you know, how you did, I used yeah. to get angry super quick. And it's one of those things that like, I don't like, I don't like it when I act that way yeah. and you have to actively proactively choose to not act that way in yeah. order to not. And it's one of those things I've, I've gotten a lot better at over the last few years, but yeah. Yeah. And so what I did in learning how to do that is as I started my life consulting journey, um, I had heard a, te a YouTube teaching. Um, so the Bethel school of supernatural ministry that I went to in Atlanta, the kind of parent school, parent church is actually in California. Okay. And so um, my church at the time um, here in Lansing had kind of been connected. And so I just kind of saw a YouTube video come across my Facebook feed or something. And um, her name is Abby Stumvall. And she was talking about um, breaking up with shame and learning self-love. And it blew my mind because I had never thought about shame as something that you could get rid of. I didn't even really understand what shame was at the time. I had some semblance of an idea. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just started following her on Instagram, looking at her like, what does she do? Who is she? Who is this person? I'd never heard of her before. And so um, she started advertising that she and her husband had started a podcast. I started listening to their podcast. It's called The Connected Life. And they are some of the most real people I have ever seen in my entire life mm. or heard of in my entire life. And they just talked about their story of how they got married, what happened after like their first year of marriage and just how they ended up becoming life consultants. 
And so they were putting on a class soon after they launched their podcast, which ended up being the spring after my mom had passed. And so I had wanted to do it because I was like, I'm going to be going through grief. I need somebody to walk me through this because I lost a parent at 29. I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, And so I didn't end up being able to do it then, but I listened to the podcast that whole year. And then they offered the class again, Living Fully Alive. Um, And so I did it January of 2020, which was beautiful, going into all of whatever 2020 was. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, And I had been working full time at the time. um, And my husband was a stay-at-home dad with both of our kids. I tried stay-at-home mom. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh my gosh. I love, I love my kids. Um, but I'm did, so extroverted and people. Did you like, like, like hate the people? Not necessarily hate. That's right. not the street. That's not the right word, but like, I guess jealous of the parents, the moms that can stay home and still love their kids unconditionally. <laughs> well, and that's just it. Like part of the, I think the movement in our generation is just this understanding of there's no perfect parents. Yeah. Like you have real life. Like I, as a mom, am an individual. I am also a mom. I am also a daughter. I am also a working individual. I'm also a wife. And being able to recognize and make space for all of those different hats. And so, but yeah, I 100% in that season felt like a complete failure because it was like, I don't want to be around my kids. I don't understand. I definitely went through postpartum depression I didn't realize it at the time, yeah. Um, but I had a three-year-old and a newborn. My husband was starting a new business adventure. We ended up having only one car. Oh my gosh. My second kid was born in November. And so I went through the winter months with a three-year-old and a newborn oh. with one car oh my gosh. as an extrovert. <laughs> it did not go well. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, my husband and I like... We communicate, and that's been something that I would not trade for the life of me. We actually set a rule, like, really early on in our marriage that um, if we think something three times, like, in a conversation, that we have to say it. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. How, how has that worked out? Most of the time, it's actually really beneficial because a lot of the things that we think in our brain – Um, especially in really difficult conversations is just out of fear and it's our little kid showing up in our story. And so like my little girl wants to be chosen. She didn't feel like she was chosen growing up. She wants to have a voice. She didn't feel like she got to have a voice because my mom was really loud and my little brother's problems were really loud and not problems, but his behavior, his behavior and his needs were really loud. And so my little Jessica didn't, I didn't feel growing up that I could have needs. Right. And so being able to give the space for both of us to be able to trade needs um, has been so huge. That's one thing um, growing up I, I struggled with was communication. And like the first few years of, I guess, our relationship, um, I, I would always like, whenever something happened, like I was upset about something, I wouldn't talk about it. I would just internalize it. And then when, when things exploded, then that's when everything came out. Yeah. And she's like, why that happened like a year ago. <laughs> <laughs> but so it's yeah. one of those things, like I had to learn how to communicate. It's very difficult, yeah. you know, because it's, you know, you're scared, especially like when you're dealing with abandonment issues, like you had mentioned, you know, I went into foster care yeah. and I um, didn't know my real dad until I was just a few years ago. Um, wow. And, so there was that kind of that abandonment and then there was that abandonment of my, my mom, you know, losing us to foster care and then all the trauma and everything growing up in foster care. And, uh, oh, I'm sure. Um, all that tied to, to me as an adult and not knowing how, to, how a relationship should be and not knowing how to communicate oh gosh, in a yeah. relationship. And so it's one of those things that like now I communicate, you know, I, I, pretty, I talk about things all the time and we have a it's great beautiful. relationship, but at first it was like, it was terrible. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't talk about it and, and it was just, things would explode and then become even more crazy. Oh my gosh. Dude, I miss those days. (laughs) (laughs) I feel you on that one. Thank goodness we like grow and just keep getting better. Yeah. Yeah. That's the goal, right? Yeah. And so, um, I want to come back to the pain cycle. That's where I had been a while back. Um, but 
So I had taken this class. It was a 14 week class. Um, and just as I was in it, was it online? Um, yeah. So okay. they had, they do a, like a video, an hour ish long video a week and there's homework in between. So okay. you actually like dive into your belief systems. You learn about the, some of the science and how your body reacts when you get triggered. Um, you look at where your beliefs and your emotions actually come from in your did, thoughts and stuff. Did you find any contradicting things as far as coming, like coming from a religious perspective and, uh, more of like a science based, like, uh, I don't know what their perspective was, but mm -hmm. what was that like? Um, they actually explained a lot of the psychology because okay. um, they talk about the the duality of holding logic and emotions mm. um, because we have those two different pieces in our brain yeah. where our emotions are actually really valid. They're important because they're just trying to tell us something, um, but our logic creates safety. So that we can function on a, on a regular basis. Yeah. We're always trying to deduce and pick up things and reason yeah. everything. And a lot of that can be kind of a protector also if you use logic to dismiss your emotions or deny that they exist. That's also a thing. Um, but they talk about just the marriage between logic and emotions and then also um, compassion and empowerment. And that's one of the bases of my business and my logo. Um, because if you have compassion without ownership, it looks like pity and pity is not going to solve anything. It's just going to like, Oh, that really sucks. Like, that's <laughs> terrible. Like that's it. <laughs> it doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't do anything. Um, but then if you have ownership without compassion, it looks like legalism and rules and just, Oh, like this is what I have to do. And that's it. So you have to marry the two because compassion with ownership looks like, man, like, I'm so sorry that that happened to you. It makes a lot of sense that you would feel that way and you don't have to live there anymore. Like you're not a victim to your circumstances anymore. Maybe at some point you picked up that victim mentality and carried that with you because of what happened to you. But now you actually get to decide. You get to have ownership over your own story and you can create that space where you can have compassion and ownership at the same time. And that was mind blowing to me that you can actually have emotional conversations. And they talk about how in order to move from your amygdala back to your logic and reasoning, you have to meet emotion to emotion and then logic with logic. Because if you're triggered, you're stuck in your 4F response. And you, like they say scientifically, it takes three minutes for all of the blood to kind of start passing back to your executive order and your um, prefrontal cortex, which is partially because of the our, the way our bodies are wired for survival. Yeah. And so when you're in your trigger in your amygdala, having somebody say, oh, it's going to be fine. <sighs> like, or get up and walk it off if you're, if you've skinned your knees, like that doesn't actually help you in the moment, <laughs> which is something that we grew up with, like, and our parents grew up with and their parents grew up it's with. That and tough love mentality. Exactly. Yeah. And so what somebody needs is actually like somebody to just sit with you. Oh my goodness. Like, I'm so sorry that happened to you. And I actually had it happen with my daughter a couple of weeks ago where she, I don't even remember the circumstance, but she was really upset about something. And I just picked her up and I just held her. And she just cried in my arms for maybe two minutes. And then all of a sudden she was better. Hmm. Like, and all I had to do was like meet her in her emotions yeah, and say, honey, I'm so sorry. Like, and even the, it's going to be okay, but not like brushing it off where she can feel the emotion in it. Like, it'll be okay, baby girl. Like I'm here. I'm with you right? because healing happens in connection. So coming back to the pain cycle, when you have something that happens to you and they talk about this in living fully alive, where like if you have two different stories where let's say a kid gets bullied on the playground and he comes home and his parents are like, oh, boo hoo. Like, that's really hard. Everybody gets bullied. Like, oh, pick it up. Parents. Like, <laughs> yeah, or something like that. Yeah. Um, if he's not met with compassion like oh babe like I'm so sorry that's terrible yeah um if he's met with suck it up move on kind of a thing 
Um, and then this other kid who maybe loses a parent really young, but is surrounded by love and people who support him or her and just say like, that's really hard. It's okay. You have all the time you need to grieve all of the space that you need. We're with you. We're for you. This kid who got bullied on the playground will likely have a more traumatic event than this kid who lost a parent, which when we think about it, like this would clearly be a more traumatic event, Yeah. but that's why you can't compare pain. Right. And so if you have somebody that can meet you in that emotion, that's what breaks up the pain cycle. Well, I mean, I can kind of see that in my own life, going back to the way like I would uh, handle my own relationship or even like my early um, fatherhood. Um, I, one thing I noticed is I was repeating a lot of the same things that I had seen growing up and thought that was normal. Yeah. And like my wife's like, that's not normal. (laughs) (laughs) Right. And you don't know it's not normal until you have somebody else that can like look at the whole situation and say, let's kind of take a look at that. (laughs) So it's important. Like for me, I'm like, uh, I observe, I try to observe myself and like, I realize when I, I do something that, you know, is I don't like. Mm-hmm. Um, and that if, for me, I can break the cycle a little bit that yeah. way. Um, and then going to therapy off also helped me Good tremendously after That's I huge. did that, like I, things changed drastically for me. That's huge. Um, but yeah, it's, it's one of those things that I realize at, at a kind of like, thankfully at a young age, I was like, I'm repeating my, I'm repeating my past. Right. It, That's huge. It is. Good awareness, by the way. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Um, I don't remember where we we're going with that, but that's okay. I was just I talking was, about the pain cycle. So, yeah, I think I was just kind of reiterating it with my experience. Mm-hmm. You know, I could kind of see it in myself. So, yeah. And so I took this 14 week class. I ate it up like candy, like everything in it. It just made so much sense. And I, I loved the community that they were building Um, Just this real genuine people where they don't judge your pain. They don't judge your past. Is it a religious, um, like does it have a religious base to it? Kind of. I mean, Justin and Abby Stumvall um, are Christians. She actually taught at the School of Supernatural Ministry in California for a long time. Okay. um, Until they became life consultants. Um, But when they teach and do these courses, like they do talk about God, they do have Bible verses and just kind of the story of what backs it up, but they are like, they're not going to force religion on you. They'll meet people wherever they are because everybody has pain. Yeah, Everybody's story is worthy of being heard. And just because you do or don't believe in God or in Jesus or whatever it is, it doesn't make your story any less valid. Right. And so kind of what they do Instead of like, okay, let's bring God into your memory or Jesus into your memory. They say, what would it look like if unconditional love showed up in that particular memory, whatever trigger comes up? Um, Because that's still real. Yeah. Like you can still have unconditional love without talking about Jesus. I mean, I, I know that that's who I'm talking about when I say unconditional love. I mean, you experience it when you're a parent. Right. Yes. Like, I mean, could you imagine not loving your kid? Right. Like I couldn't imagine not loving my, right. my kid, my, yeah. my daughter or my son. Right. And I mean, like my five-year-old when <clears> she <throat> was like one and two and she was learning about her body motion and sometimes kids can get away with a lot more, than <laughs> <laughs> but she, like when she would get really tired, if I would be holding her, like every once in a while, she would just like, pat, 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 like just hit me in the head. And I'm like, <laughs> We're going to have gentle hands, <laughs> but it's like, I don't not love her. Yeah. She's just learning. Right. <laughs> so, right. So I'm not going to judge her for learning something. Right. Um, and so took the course. I actually ended up taking it again last year as a refresher, just because going through 2020, I like, I was like, I will do anything to get back into this community (laughs) because there was a lot of, there are so many tools that they talk about that I have access to that I want to be able to give my clients. Um, when did you, you started the business in 2020? Uh, actually I just started in April. Oh wow. March, April. Yeah. Um, but I took it again because I wanted to be a life consultant. I saw what they were doing. I saw how impactful it was. I saw just how life changing being able to understand compassion and ownership is, And I saw it and I was like, this could absolutely change the world. Like if people could just grasp that, 
my pain is not worse than your pain. Mm -hmm. Your pain is not worse than my pain. We both exist. We both have pain. We both have the opportunity to have compassion and ownership so that we can feel loved and accepted. You can feel loved and accepted and we can exist in that space. Right. That would just change everything. Absolutely change everything. And so I took it again um, in 2021 and was like, this is something that I want to do for the rest of my life. Like I want to help people. I was in banking at the time. I love numbers. I'm really good with numbers, but I was in it for the people. Yeah. Um, and I was in a really solitary position at the time. Um, it was a new position when I was going through the second time and it was just not a good fit. And so I started doing this master class in October. Um, I actually got let go from my job in November because it wasn't a right fit. Um, and so it was kind of just like is this the right time? I don't know. Like, and so I just kind of took a couple months and just kind of sat with it. Like, and I had applied for a couple of jobs to try to get unemployment. And every time I just had this gut check, like Mm. I, I know that I'm a good employee, but I also know that I want to start my own business and it's not fair to apply for another job. If I'm going to be piecing out whenever I get the opportunity (laughs) to start my own business. So, um, so I just decided, you know what, we're going to, I, I met a friend of mine, um, and was just like, got this resounding yes. And it was just like God moment after God moment after God moment in one week where it was like, okay, like I need to get this going. Wow. So yeah. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. That's truly amazing. So when somebody comes in and they require your services, Mm -hmm. um, what does that look like? What does a session with you look like? Um, So we'll go over kind of what's been going on that week or that month, kind of depending on how often they want to meet with me. Um, And I'll just kind of listen and pay attention. And at some point during the story, if I can see that they're experiencing some emotions as they're talking about their story, I'll just kind of say, hey, let's sit with that emotion for a minute. Let's figure out how old that emotion is. And so we'll, we'll just kind of sit. Maybe a memory will come up, a season. Um, so is it almost like a therapy session? Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. And so as we're sitting and they give me an age, I'll say, okay, so at that age, like what's going on? What is little you experiencing? What is What are the feelings? And if they come up with a memory and they're relating to a person, um, I'll essentially just bring safety or comfort because a lot of the times they're feeling fear, they're feeling disconnection, they're feeling abandoned or rejected, or they're feeling like they're not enough. Yeah. Um, they're feeling maybe performance, like I have to perform for love. And so I get to bring compassion and ownership into that space. And I get to just kind of talk to little them. I get to actually repair their relationship with their self because the pain cycle, an event happens. If you don't have somebody attuning with you, which is just that idea of I'm with you in your pain, I'm happy to be with you. If you don't have that, you actually like continue the cycle and you get stuck in that place of pain. And so I get to go into that memory, that pain cycle and bring compassion What's the difference between therapy and that? I mean, because from what you're explaining to me, I've done therapy and it's almost one of those things, you know, in in therapy, you can just kind of say whatever you want Mm -hmm. and you just kind of tell them what's going on and they may like discuss it with you. But what you're doing is you're pinpointing like a a root cause, Mm -hmm. You're coming down to a root cause and you're talking about it and Mm -hmm. it seems more proactive to me. That's the goal. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah is to be able to find out that root cause, that root symptom, because you're looking at your belief systems as a whole. And so we want to figure out like, where did that belief come from? Because if you are, like you've talked about your anger cycles, Mm -hmm. if you can pinpoint where that started, whatever memory that started, where little David didn't have somebody (laughs) meeting him with comfort, with safety, with security, then we get to recreate a picture. So I do a lot of visualizations. So um, I'll have people put their hand on their heart, close their eyes, and just kind of visualize that memory where they're probably feeling fear, anger, something. And so then I'll say, who is a safe person that we can bring into that memory? And everybody has at least one safe person or a safe pet where they felt loved and connected to 
And so we get to bring a resource into that space Mm -hmm. because our brain can't tell the difference between what's actually in front of us and what we can visualize. And so then we just kind of sit in that emotion of safety or security, of love, of comfort. And in some respect, kind of change that memory so that you have attunement and you don't have to keep repeating those cycles. That's awesome. It's amazing. That is really cool. It's absolutely amazing. Have you had a lot of customers or a lot of clients since you started the business? I've had a few, yeah. Yeah. Um, It's kind of been slow going, which I kind of like because I can get to know my clients without having like a bunch of people that I'm trying to keep track of. Um, but I'm, I'm also still in my class. So, mm-hmm. um, which so, ends in October. Um, what was I going to, I just, I just lost my train <laughs> of thought. <laughs> Talking about clients. <laughs> um, that's, that's one thing that's interesting though, that you're not that busy because mental health, cri- th- th- we're in a mental, mental health crisis right yeah. now. Um, yeah. I know somebody who's trying to get therapy and they need a therapy like on like a specific day like they that day they're like i need to go see a therapist i need to talk to somebody and there was nobody available she even called the insurance company (sighs) the insurance company's like we'll call you back never called back until like four days later because they were going to provide a list of um you know sure services services or whatever yeah and no they didn't oh my god and it's insane and then she couldn't get all these uh uh therapy places to call her back and yeah. it's just crazy that it's insane crazy. and i think the hard part for me is i don't take insurance because okay. i'm not accredited i'm okay. not certified Could you at, at a certain point um i would probably have to be certified and regulated um my goal what does that mean like what does that uh, mean like having regulations in place because a lot of therapists the, like from what i've heard i have not um personally pursue therapy because I found life consulting. It's amazing. (laughs) Um, But from what I've heard, like there's so many different pieces and regulations that you have to have in order to keep your license, to move your clients through things um, that like, there's not a way to measure whether or not my client is experiencing growth. Oh, okay. Right. Um, Because it's, it's all subject, like it's all yeah. relative. Yeah. It's all, if you're experiencing growth, you're experiencing it and yeah. it's not my job to fix you. Right. Um, is I it, just get is to it, so is it like a life coach type of kind of business? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So because I don't have insurance, people pay out of pocket, but my, yeah. my hope, um, is to kind of reach out to the community and start raising funds so that I can have, sessions sponsored for people that do have financial trouble because everybody, everybody needs somebody to talk to. Yeah. And I, I never want finances to be the block right. for you getting the healing that you are worthy of Yeah, because everybody needs it. Yeah. Especially now more than ever coming out of the yeah. pandemic was insane and it, yeah. you're kind of seeing the effects of it too, like on the on young people and yeah. I mean, just everybody, Yeah, everybody, everybody's yeah. struggling. It's so true. And at the same time, like my cost is what it is because I understand what I'm worth. Yeah. But I also understand like you're healing in some ways, like you have to have a buy-in. You have to like the cost that you're paying is also what you're worth. Like you're worth investing in. And if somebody is going to kind of continue paying your way, like you might not see the value that you have in pursuing your own emotional health yeah so what kind of effects do you think it would have on somebody who has let's say like um the crippling effect of like a uh, crippling like uh like depression mm-hmm. or like anxiety if they mm-hmm. were to come talk to you do you think you could um help like pinpoint that and have you have you worked with anybody like that who who um, who've had extreme like depression or anxiety that's a good question um I mean, I've had a limited amount of clients, so I don't yeah. know like this full scope, but I know a couple of them have actually had anxiety and just, I mean, anxiety is just a form of fear where I, I don't feel safe. And so I would love to say like, yeah, I can, but I, I can't cure anxiety and right. I can't no. cure depression. But, no, but like, by talking about it and trying to pinpoint yeah. what, what uh, creates that and what, what yeah. happened in their past life to, yeah. or, you know, previous life, to, pre, not previous life, but you know, <laughs> yeah. What happened to them specifically, what, what's creating that? Yeah. 
have you been able to pinpoint that? There's a people? few, there's a few pieces. I'm, I'm thinking of a couple of different clients where I've been able to pinpoint like where performance has shown up and like where different cycles have shown up to be able to bring peace and safety to. Yeah. I love it so much. It's, oh my <laughs> gosh. When somebody leaves my office having hope yeah. for change in their cycles, it means the world to me. I mean, most people just need somebody to talk to, honestly. Yeah. I mean, and that's that's why therapy is, you know, really short. Like you can't find therapists right now because people yeah. need somebody to talk to. And that's yeah. one thing that helped me when I went to therapy is like, that's one thing I realized. I just needed to talk. Yeah. I just need somebody to hear me who's, who doesn't know me and doesn't know my situation and yeah. looks at the situation from an unbiased point of view and then can help me kind of like put things into order and yeah. explain things to me. Yeah. I actually am so honored. Like I, Again, I'm such a people person. And so when somebody comes in to talk to me, um, they fill out the client intake form so I get to know their history. The moment that I read their history, I actually start falling in love with the person. Like when you think about it, if you talk to somebody like, oh yeah, I struggle with anxiety or depression or like suicidal thoughts or yada, yada, yada. If you're talking with them on the street, it's like, ooh. That's heavy. I don't know that I like want to dive into all that. But if I'm reading it and as like as a consultant and this person is my client, like, and I, it, I had it happen with one of my clients. I just started reading their story and who they are. And before I even had the opportunity to meet them, figure out who they were, like my heart was just so going out to them. And I had so much compassion on their story because my job is just to listen to stories yeah. really. And to just bring love into places that they have deemed unlovable. Or other people have deemed unlovable. Do you think that, well, I have a couple questions with sure. that. So do you think by doing this and helping other people that it in turn helps you? I mean, to some extent. Yeah. I mean, because I need a paycheck to pay my kids. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I mean, not not like, not in monetization okay. um, aspects, but like in like mental health and by helping other people, yeah. it makes you feel better as a person and helps you with your healing journey. To some extent, because as I can figure out different pieces in somebody else's story, if there's something that I relate to in a session, um, my job as a consultant is to stay regulated, to yeah. stay unbiased. But if I get triggered in a session, it's my job internally to just be like, hey, little Jess, like I see that you're showing up. I see that maybe there's fear, anxiety. There's something in you that needs healing because I can hear something in somebody else's story. Yeah. Um, and then I get to go to her or go to my life consultant and say, Hey, this thing came up in one? a session. I do. Oh, actually okay. I have two. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> well, there's interns in the, in the course that we're doing, okay. um, that we see monthly. So I have my own okay. life consultant that I meet with monthly. Um, but I'll be supplementing them very soon because I only that, meet with them once a month. So. That was my other question is how do you handle all of that? Because that, that's a oh lot gosh, of, yeah. that's a, that's a load of like just other people's drama yeah. and other people's like, just, Oh, like I couldn't even imagine that's like a load <laughs> on your shoulders that you're taking you do on. It here. <laughs> yes. To some extent. Yeah. But I can just like post it and ghost it type of thing. Like <laughs> right. I don't have any like like I emotional buy-in yeah. kind of a thing. Yeah. I don't yeah. Have emotional buy-in. Like I don't you're not have, meeting with them regularly. Yeah. I don't yeah. have an expertise in it. Yeah. I'm just listening to people talk. Yeah. Um, I mean, I love the beach, so that's kind of where I go to, <laughs> like I, one of my things that I've been learning is my little girl just needs space, like all of this space. And so in one of my own consulting sessions, um, my consultant, uh, was like, what does little Jessica need? And I was like, honestly, I just want to go and run outside. And so I literally, I have this field kind of like from the sounds of music, sound mm. of music <laughs> where like little Jessica can just go and it's this beautiful open field and it's all mine. Mm. <laughs> like, but I like adult me knows that if I can create this massive open field in my mind that I have all of the access to whenever I want, I know that you can also have all of the space that you need for all of your emotions that is safe yeah. and Joe Schmo on the street, Jane Doe, like each person has that opportunity to create that safety in their brain of, I have all the space that I need for all of my emotions because I can visualize it. 
and we still need connection. So sometimes there are people that I bring into that field where I can play with them and just bring love and safety to my little girl because that's all she ever needed was somebody to play with, space for her emotions, and somebody to tell her that she was important enough. Yeah, yeah. Is there anything else you want to talk about? How, well, how can people sign up for your services? How can they get yeah. a hold of you? How can they contact you? So it's safespacelifeconsulting.com. It's also on Facebook, Safe Space Life Consulting, or Instagram at Safe Space LC. Um, I just started that a couple of days ago. So if you want to <laughs> hear more about me, you can actually go and look at my Instagram. I tell a little bit about my husband and my girls and my why for what I do. Um, and then, yeah, right on my page, you can sign up for a right fit consultation it's 15 ish minutes because it's never 15 minutes (laughs) I like talking to people too much um to see if life consulting is a right fit for them because maybe it's not maybe it's not right for their season um maybe the financial commitment isn't you know what's right um and as soon as I have sponsors available I will make sure to (laughs) let people know that too okay awesome and uh i'll put all of that in the show notes so that'll be available awesome thank you so much david thank you this was fun me too